a lot, surprisingly, of biohackers who use epithalon to extend their telomeres. I've gotten a lot of comments about that over the last year and a half, and I always try to respond to them, warning people. Good morning, friends. Today I want to talk to you guys about Virgil Abloh's recent passing. I think that we can learn a couple of interesting lessons from it. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, like the video, and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. First of all, a word about Virgil Abloh. Virgil Abloh was a very beloved member of the fashion community, the African-American community as well. He was a philanthropic person and lived a great life. He is already greatly missed by people. For those that don't know of his accomplishments, he is the person who started the off-white urban streetwear, kind of high-end streetwear brand. He was also the head of the menswear division at Louis Vuitton. He was the first African-American head of that division, which was a major accomplishment, pushing up the glass ceiling that previously prevented African-Americans from getting into the highest fashion labels. So he was a very beloved person. Now Virgil Abloh knew about his cancer for a period of time and never made it public. And what I wanted to tell you guys is he certainly knew that he was dying. I doubt that he had any hope to live. So it was really interesting that he didn't tell people about it. Now let's see if we can learn any lessons from this very rare cancer and what it may tell us about the way the cancer developed and how it may affect all of us in the future as well. So first of all, Virgil had what's called a primary cardiac angiosarcoma. Primary means that's where the tumor started. It was in his heart. But let's get into what sarcomas are. Sarcomas are cancers that originate in mesenchymal cells. Those are the cells that produce eventually connective tissue. Sarcoma comes from the, a Greek word that means something like a fleshy substance. So soft tissue sarcomas are very rare, but angiosarcomas are even more rare. Angio, the prefix angio, you probably heard me say before, angio relates to blood vessels usually. So for example, angiogenesis is the birth of new blood vessels. One of the primary mechanisms actually that cancers, all cancers used to, well not all, but many cancers used to spread. And that angiogenesis is often governed by a growth factor called VEGF, which I mentioned a lot, vascular endothelial growth factor. And VEGF's governed a little bit by IGF-1 and growth hormone. That's one of the reasons having high IGF-1 levels or growth hormone levels in adulthood can be dangerous, particularly for cancers, just because of this blood vessel development. But in this case, the cancer is actually in the blood vessels. And these kind of angiosarcomas contribute one to 2% of all sarcomas. Remember, sarcomas are originally rare. Moreover, nearly 50% of the angiosarcomas happen in people's necks and heads. This case, what we're talking about here, a cardiac angiosarcoma is exceedingly rare. In fact, cardiac angiosarcomas strike about one in a million people. So this is an extremely rare disease. It's so rare that it's not well understood and there isn't even a standard procedure to treating it really. And cardiac angiosarcomas are most common in the third to fifth decades of life and note that Virgil Abloh was, he's only eight years older than me, I think he was in his early 40s. And they also usually strike men rather than women. They're about doubly or triply more likely men to develop it than women. So what do doctors do when they encounter this highly rare disease? Well, the first thing is it's usually not detected. Cardiac angiosarcomas barely have any symptoms. The symptoms are actually very broad, so it's very difficult to predict that it's gonna have this, that the person has a cancer in their heart. So for example, the symptoms are fatigue, chest pain, very simple symptoms like that. So it's usually not detected. But when doctors do want to detect it, it's quite easy to scan for. So for example, they use a transesophageal echocardiogram that is, has a 97% sensitivity. They also use CT scans to try to get an idea of where the tumor is and so on. And cardiac fMRI scans are actually much more detailed for this, allowing doctors to be able to distinguish between the different soft tissues. So they can detect it, but once they detect it, there's still not very much they can do. The best treatment option is to cut out the tumor. Cutting out the tumor can change life expectancies from around four months to around 14 months. But that is the life expectancy even if they cut it out. Without surgery, 90% of people die within a year. And with surgery, most of them don't get to two years. Just to note, other than surgery, there is no standard chemotherapy or standard radiation therapy for this kind of cancer. Doctors sort of try to figure it out each time on their own because it's that rare. And moreover, sometimes when younger people get this kind of cancer, the cardiac angiosarcomas, they, after doing surgery or replacing, sometimes they replace the heart, they find that even with heart transplants, because of this disease's nature to metastasize, which means spread across the body, the prognosis for people is still very poor. Basically, almost nobody survives this, and Virgil probably knew that. So I think we should stop here to note one lesson. The lesson is that we don't have as much control of our destinies and our health as we really think. The progress of cancer treatment over the last seven years has been quite small actually. 
50 years ago or 70 years ago, there were only three methods, and now there's sort of three and immunomodulatory therapy, which isn't that great. The methods are cut it out, like with a surgery here, cut out the tumor, or burn it, like with radiation, or poison it with chemotherapy. And now there's some immunomodulatory therapy, but it's not an easy solution. So there are cancers that doctors simply can't treat, and you may not expect that you might get one, and if you do, your life may be over. And this, this applies to all of us. So this is an important learning lesson as well. The second lesson I want to talk about is the etiology of this very rare disease, cardiac angiosarcomas. What can we learn about its causality? How does it get caused? Is there something in common between the various people that get this disease? There might be. You see, there are familial patterns of cardiac angiosarcomas. Not all of them, though. Some are sporadic, but some are familial. For example, a person's parents, one of their parents would die in their 30s or 40s from it, and the child would get it as well. In studying the familial pattern, they've been able to find a common a polymorphism in the people's genes that may cause this disease. And we can learn something about the causality of the disease via that polymorphism. But I want to mention first that this polymorphism or the mutation here is found in a minority of both the familial and the sporadic cases. But nonetheless, it's still informative. The mutation is in the POT1 gene. That's protection of telomerase 1. And what this mutation does, it makes the POT1 gene less able to control the activity of telomerase. But to understand what that means, we have to review telomeres and telomerase briefly. So what's a telomere? A telomere, think of it this way. You have chromosomes, and at the end of them, think of your shoestring. This is David Sinclair's example. If you look at the end of your shoestring, there's like a plastic, I don't even know what it's called, but a plastic piece to keep the shoestring from becoming freight. In a similar way, our cells continue to divide in our lifetimes, and to do so intact without what's called genomic instability, damage to the genome, we have telomeres that wrap around the end of our chromosomes. As our cells divide in life, these telomeres shorten. In fact, they shorten due to a couple of causes. One is the actual replication, and another is actually oxidative stress to the telomeres. You see, the telomeres are the most vulnerable part of our genome to oxidative stress. So they take the brunt of it, and when they do, they shorten. As telomeres shorten, we become less able to replicate cells. And this takes us to a kind of, really, a protective mechanism, if you think about it, against cancer development, which is that at some point the telomeres are too short, the cell turns into a senescent cell and can no longer produce what's called hyperplasia division. Now, we usually think of senescent cells as pro-inflammatory and one of the causes of the disease of aging, but it's also one of the natural mechanisms that inhibits unlimited or pathological cell division. So when our telomeres are extended, they're lengthened, they may potentially predispose us to cancers as well. So if telomerase, the enzyme that extends telomeres, is overactive, we may end up with exceptionally long telomeres, which could cause us to have excess cell division, even in pathological states. And by the way, the interesting side note, lab mice have unusually long telomeres, which is one of the criticisms that people have for using lab mice to study cancers. Lab mice are much more likely to develop cancer than us because their telomeres are so long. But interestingly, there's a paradox about telomeres. Very short telomeres, so for example, people who smoke cigarettes have very short telomeres due to oxidative stress. Very short telomeres are associated with cancer, and very long telomeres are also associated with cancer. And this is called the telomere paradox. Now, a side note as well, there are a lot, of, a lot surprisingly, of biohackers who use epithalon, to ex which is a modulator of telomerase, to extend their telomeres. I've gotten a lot of comments about that over the last year and a half that I've had my channel. And I always try to respond to them, warning people that although having very short telomeres can cause genomic instability and damage to the genome, which then if the cells replicate, you have damage in the genome, so there's a cancer at risk there. But if you have very long telomeres, you also just extend the replication process. So you also have another risk of having telomere-induced cancers. Now, although the POT1 mutation only affects a minority, it's about 20% of sporadic cases or something like that, it's still instructive, I think. It may have not have been the case with Virgil Abloh that he had this mutation, but maybe telomere lengthening has some role, particularly in the cardiac angiosarcomas. Interestingly, by the way, long telomeres are particularly associated with rare cancers as opposed to common cancers. Although, and by the way, a side note about the protective effect of long telomeres, having long telomeres is protective for cardiovascular disease, but it's of course harmful for the rare cancers in particular. And then having very short cancer, uh, telomeres is also harmful for cancers in general because it could cause genomic instability. Sorry for repeating myself a bit, I just wanted to be clear. So what's the long and short of it all? Well, I think there's two lessons here. One is we're not as in control of our fates as we think. The progress of science hasn't progressed as much as we think in the last 70 years. Even common cancers remain deadly, like the cancer that took my grandmother, liver cancer. Still has a horrible prognosis, and that's a very common cancer. But there are also these very rare cancers that the medical community barely knows what to do with. Second, there's a lesson about telomeres. 
The idea that we should try to extend our telomeres is very dangerous, particularly for rare cancers. On the other hand, honestly, shortening the telomeres through things like oxidative stress, like smoking, could be protective for those rare cancers. But at the same time, having short telomeres can damage your genome and cause you to be more likely to develop cancers. So there's basically what I'm trying to say there is we shouldn't try to intervene on our telomere length at the very least. And I think there's a third lesson as well here, which is that there are such cancers that are that rare that we don't hear about them that often, like a cancer of the heart. Although this cancer was very rare, it wasn't as rare as Virgil Abloh. He was a one in eight billion person as opposed to a one in a million cancer. Anyway guys, I thank you for bearing with me. I hope this was slightly informative and I hope to see you again this afternoon.